Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We're gathered together today on the 25th of the fourth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with the 8th of July, 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our read-through of what is called the Genesis Apocryphon, which is also known as the Tales of the Patriarchs, and it covers one QAP gen for the scrolls uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls collection. Okay, it is the first hand accounts of both the uh, the writings of Lemech, Methuselah, possibly Hanok or Enoch, and then as we're reading right now. It is Noach writing his personal first hand. He puts I and he adds in, in the first person in the account. And then later on, as we'll see, Abram's or Abraham's writings in the first person are also here. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this is contemporary with just after the flood. If you remember, he had already gone over the account of his birth, which happens to be attached to what we call first Enoch or Hanok, right? And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was a separate writing. Now we're going through what Noach says for himself. And as you can see, this takes place after the flood where he's going throughout the length of throughout the land. So for the longer sections here, just for continuity's sake, and we'll we'll just read through it. When it's broken up quite a bit, when you see it's just pieces like this, we'll just talk about it mention what it's alluding to and kind of move on because we don't really need to dig too much when it's when there isn't too much to look at but here we go it says then i noach noach right to rest and comfort went out and walked throughout the land through its length and through its breadth and that word right there is rather interesting the word in the Greek for it is plateaus, where you get the word plateau in English, which is a flat surface on an elevated height, right? But plateaus is that wide, flat breadth of like the earth. When it says in Revelation that Satan causes all those to come up from the breadth of the from the breadth of the earth, it's from the literal the flat plain of the land to surround the Yerushalayim after he's released again, right? Very interesting use of that word throughout scripture. I would like to find out which one it happens to be right here. I think it might be there, but I'll be honest, I, I don't know off the top of my head. This is Ani Noach went forth and walked, or that's Helakat, the Helakot, sorry, and walked in uh, or throughout the land. Unto its length and unto uh, the breath, La Patach, that's the opening or the wide space of. Okay. Pa, poth, poth, uh, it's like um, the opening of the mouth. Which is interesting, but I'll have to look at that word. So, sorry, didn't mean to digress there. This is the benefit of learning the Hebrew for anyone who's interested. Which, you, if you take your time, just get a dictionary, and you start looking up the words, you, it'll help you so you don't have to rely on just what people say. Something means, you can see it for yourself. And quite often, you'll find that a literal translation is not used, but what it is implied to mean when if you use a literal translation there's so much more there that's it's pretty amazing but anyways it says then he went throughout the land through its length and through its breath okay upon it the rejuvenation in their leaves and in their fruit meaning that after the whole year had passed and there was dryness on the land he had waited another 10 days and when he came out on the 27th of that second month he found that there to be fruit right, to the, their leaves and in their fruit, right? The entire land was full of grass, herbs, and grain. Then I Barak Yahuwah of Shemaim, 
whose praise endures forever, and to whom be the esteem or kavod. Um, while we're on that right there, a lot of people might have a problem with the word glory as it relates to the word for kavod or esteem, what we would also translate as honor, right? The, uh, the word itself in scripture, if you look at where kavod is used, it is actually used as honor. It literally means heaviness. And the especially in the Psalms, the connotations of his esteem like the light and like the rays of the sun is exactly without any difference what you can derive from the meaning of glory. So the, the scriptural reference to the light being his honor is scriptural and it does that does a perfect job for fitting it people don't like to use this word because it's associated with sun worship or like the corona of the rays of light around the heads of, of figures that they draw but um i'm not trying to promote any of that i only want what is true and what you can find in scripture and the fact that the kavod of yahuwah is like the light or the rays of light is exactly the same as what you can read when you see glory. I don't personally use that word because some people find it offensive, but I have no issue with it when people, especially when they don't know anything, say it, okay? There's some of the lines that I, I don't cross, and there there's some that don't really matter. I don't try to fight battles that are not important. And again, if you want a list of words you really ought to avoid, it's right in what they call the sacred names, or in Latin, the nomnia sacra. There was, from the 3rd century to the 14th century, Greek manuscripts that were used that had code words or placeholders in place of using the Greek names or words for things. So that when you would get to the placeholder, you would use the Hebrew-sounding equivalent. You would say the word that was supposed to be in the Hebrew and not a Greek equivalent or a Latin equivalent of those or whatever. Those words were the names of the Father, the Son, the title Elohim, and El Shaddai, like the Almighty, the Most High, the word for Ruach, the word for man, as in Adam, like the son of Adam, um, and a few more. I try to use those words as the actual transliteration of the Hebrew, as much as possible and everything else i i don't sweat because his word does not define it as something that we should um, if people have an issue with it you don't you don't for the sake of food ruin someone so if someone has an issue with a word which i actually lived through people i had a a lady that we were fellowshipping with that had a very large and expansive prohibited vocabulary that we would tiptoe around for her benefit because it was the kind thing to do. It doesn't hurt anybody. Although I was honest with her, just like I'm honest right now, that these words are nowhere explicitly prohibited in Scripture, and they actually are in line with the meaning and intent of what he says. So, moving on. It says, Once again, I Barak, the one who had compassion on the land, and who removed and obliterated from it all those doing violence and wickedness and deceit. As it mentions in the exhortation, when he uprooted the children of Israel from the land, he killed off everyone that was walking intentionally contrary to the truth. They died by the sword. They went into captivity. They were plundered. Everyone according to their ways and deeds got what they deserved. And those that were his, he, he delivered. Okay, those that were not deserving of death, he rescued. The Scythians, or the ones that were known as the sons of Yitzhak, that escaped as fourth Ezra mentions, just like Abraham was rescued from the idolatry and the, the plagues of people that were happening that time, just like Noah here was rescued during the flood, just like Hanok was taken in his days, and every righteous man who was like him, Eliyahu, 
okay? And just like everyone will be when he returns that will not taste death, okay? They're going to be in the disposition of those that are rescued, right? And with the same heart and condition. It says, but the one and he obtained, this is Noah specifically that he rescued, right? And he obtained all for his sake. And there's a space in the text, right? And Lisbeth appeared to me from Shemaim, speaking with me and saying, and this would be the messenger Yahuwah, or it, literally this is our Mashiach that appeared to him. He says, do not fear Noach, which is what our Mashiach tells everyone that he comes to. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Right? He says, I am with you and with those of your sons who will be like you forever. Okay. Our Mashiach is with us. He says, he will never leave us nor forsake us. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the land, rule over all of all of them, over its seas and over its wildernesses, over its mountains and over everything that is in them. I am now giving to you and to your sons everything for food, that of the vegetation and herbs of the land, but you shall not eat any blood. The awe and fear of you, and then you can realize that he's talking about the fear of them is going to be on all of the creatures, and they were given permission at that time to consume meat, but not eat the soul or the inner being with the meat. They say the life with the blood, or the blood with the meat, because the life or the soul, the nephesh, is in the blood. And that was what was prohibited. Okay? And this is, and I am for you through the years, your children. And this is where he's talking about the commandments that he gave him afterwards. And then he gave his bow in the cloud. A lot of people say rainbow, but that word for rain is not there. It's literally... Unto you, la at his oath or his sign in the cloud. Okay. And it's the word for bow, which is the arch of the rainbow that we, we know today. It mentions in the recognitions that this is like his signet ring and his seal that his word is true. And that he's he's put his sign and seal on it that he would establish this covenant not to do what he, not to flood the earth again right all right so this is what it was revealed to him it talks about on the mountains of ararat or in secular history we know this as uratu in antiquity and where we the mountains of ararat are in modern day turkey anyone familiar with the discoveries of uh, our late brother Ron Wyatt, he had discovered Noah's Ark back in the eighties, and um, the uh, mountains of Uratu or Ararat, where it was actually landed, was right there on the Turkey-Iran border or Iran-Turkey border area. Excuse me. All right, so the text was breaking off. That was the covenant and promises given to him. And then we were continuing. It says, and for the devastation on the land was great. Then son, so that was talking about, he maybe he was recapping the flood, right? Then sons and daughters were born to my sons after the flood. To my oldest son, Shem, was first born a son a park shad, two years after the flood. Now, if you try to look up the etymology of this name in Scripture with the Strongs or anything else, it'll tell you it's of an uncertain etymo etymological origin, and they're not quite sure of its origin or meaning. Um, when you 
dig and anyone who might have other information on this, please share. I'm grateful to learn. But I've happened to come across uh, the the meaning of this name in a book from the 1800s called uh, Francis Roslin's Maserote, Maserote, or it's about the witness in the stars. It was one of the first books on the topic, and the lady that wrote it really dug into the etymologies of the names and the meanings of the words, not only with the constellations and the, and the names of the stars themselves throughout uh, all the cultures that were known at that time and their meanings for the stars as well, but the also the, the names for the meanings of words and, and people in scripture. There's quite a few in her book was rather expansive talking about a variety of these topics, all based on what's in the constellations as the stars that we can perceive when we look up. But she mentions that the meaning of a park shed is a congregation assembled. And when you put that meaning into the names from Adam to Jacob or Yisrael as the foretold sign of his, uh, uh, of his works with men and what it means like man appointed mortal sorrow, but the Baruch Elohim, he will come down dedicated and his death shall bring the despairing comfort and joy or rest, right? That was just Adam through Noah for anyone who might remember those, but you can do that. And she actually has in her book from Adam all the way down to Yaakov. And I've actually done that before where you can line that up with the creation account because the book of Yobelim says that the 22 men from Adam to Yisrael or Yaakov and the 22 works of creation during the six literal days in which he done his he did his works go together for Kodeshah and Zadika or for righteousness and set apartness. Um, and the one goes with the other. So when you line up the creation account parable, and the meanings of the names, it is amazing how they line up together. The congregation assembled of Parkshad is right after Noah or his comfort and rest, which lines up with Abram and the time where he gave his covenant and promises there. And then he assembled the people or the congregation from the literal seed of Abraham, the children of Israel. Uh, there's a lot more involved in that, but there's just a tidbit. And that was the only place I've ever found the meaning of that name, by the way. They also have a meaning for the name of Canaan, the son that was born, uh, not Canaan, but another one in the genealogy, and a few more that line up with the actual creation account. Rather, rather amazing. <clears throat> but you don't find those meanings in later, more modern texts. Says to my eldest son Shem was first born a son, a park a park shad, or a pach shad, two years after the flood, and all the sons of Shem all together were Elam, Asher, a park shad, Lud, and Aram, as well as five daughters. The Elamites became a nation and people, the king uh, over other kings, if you will, Shandalamir, right, that fought against Sodom and Gomorrah in the account that we may have covered already, but if we haven't, we most certainly will when we go back to reading on Bereshit Genesis. Because he rose up against the truth and the, the seed that was Baruch by our creator, Abraham went with 318 men and destroyed that five kingdom army and ended his people's dominance. And they actually ceased to be a named people because of what they tried to do to another. His word literally being fulfilled. Asher prospered in Baruch in the same way. Ashar, Ashri, right? Also a typified torture and doing evil things to others and in like manner that they destroyed and wiped out peoples. They, they ceased to exist as a nation. Um, a park shad would be who was given the allotment of the promised land, right? His children. And um, 
they would have been dwelling after being ousted by the Canaanim in Ur of the Kazdim amongst the Babylonians, where they, where their children would echo and return on multiple occasions, including the spiritual Babylon. So just another picture of a wheel within a wheel or a walking out the truth in, again and again in different patterns, right? Lude, if you remember, the place that was named Beth El was formerly Lude from this sun. And they went over, uh, I believe, after they were ousted, there was a survivor who went and built a place called Lude after the first one. And I want to say it was in Persia or Madai, but I don't know for certain if it was that far east. And then Aram is where we get the Arameans, and they were north of the land, if you will, and Nahor, Terak, uh, Lemek, they were all known, and Yaakov even was known as Arameans for coming from this area as well, right? But they were all related from sons of Shem. All right, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Foot or Put, Canaan, as well as seven daughters. And then real quick, Ham is who we know as Memphis in antiquity, also Nebo, um, Baal, the original, and then, and then Nimrod was another Baal, or Bel, if you will. They were the leaders of Babylon. If you, they came over, there's a lot more involved in the history there. I don't want to get too involved, but he was one of the first magicians after the flood. Those that were literally given the gifts of Satan's spirit for doing the things that were pleasing to him. Okay. Cush is Ethiopia. Uh, we That's pretty established. Okay. And it's mentioned in a few other places. Mitzrayim the means of binding up the waters or confining the waters is the meaning of his word also, or his name, uh, in more ways than one. But he was responsible. He was also known as one of the... Um, oh, if he was famous in antiquity, one of the heathen philosophies and pagan religions that came... Zoroaster. Ham was known as one of the Zoroasters, and sh and his son Mitzrayim was another Zoroaster or magician, and he had used the demons to call down fire from stars so much that he was struck by lightning and consumed with it, right? But Egypt is the land that was named after him, and then it was eventually named after Egyptus, one of the Hebrews that was in the land there. The Nile also had a different name, but it was called Nile after Neil, who was one of the Hebrews that left from that area. And the O'Neills of Ireland today still carry that very name. And then we all know Canaan, who was the son that had taken over the land that he swore that they wouldn't in the land of uh, what became Yisrael, or what they call Palestine today. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yawin, Tubal, Meshach, Tiraz, as well as four daughters. Now, these ones, Gomer, would have been, they, they say that was in northern Turkey for a while, and he was and driven further north, right? Magog with them. Magog, even during the times of antiquity, the Magogians, were the armies or the main fighting force of Antiochus Epiphans, who came from the Greek empire that was split into four, and he was from the northern portion. Okay, they are still in Turkey at that time. Uh, they, they have not left. Okay, if you want more information about Magog and Gomer and the specifics of Turkey and the relation with Antiochus Epiphans, and how these very forces were used in later times during what we call Armageddon or the Battle of Har Megiddo from Revelation, which was literally the Battle of El, El Shalderon. Yeah, I'm not saying that right, but during the World War I in 1917, 
where the papal forces and the Islamic Turkish Empire fought against the confederated believers or protestants and were conquered or overcome the papal power as a um, political force was defeated at that time and they were mainly working through the germans in that instance so you had turkey the islamic turkish empire working with rome or the eastern and western rome the you know beasts of the earth in the land and the beast out of the sea working in cahoots that had lost at that time and at the end of that that was the end of the papal power in creation kind of what they call that head wound um there's a lot playing out there but just for context anyways if you want more information on gomer and magog right here there is a video on christmas is a lie youtube channel the same video channel that does the antichrist for dummies series and they go over the battle of armageddon in detail show the historical text and history behind it and how um, expositors of, of and knew and actually foretold the events that were going to shortly happen that is completely hidden from us today so madai would have been given what we call spain and you'll see that in the text as we go along later. But they despised the area of the, their inheritance. And he petitioned his father-in-law all right, to have a, a portion over by him. And he was given the, the what we call the, Mede, the Medes today is from Madai. And the Medes and Persians were the Elamites, right? And Madai in working together. Yawin is what we call Greece today. And the original was from the son of Yefeth, but the city-states, Athens, Calcol, uh, the city, the Attica, the uh, all the city-states where culture was developing in what became Greece was Hebrews migrating out of Egypt, as we've talked about before, and we'll cover in more detail later. So they mixed with the indigenous sons of Yefeth and became what we call the Greek people, which is why you see the Yahudim in the times of the renewed covenant with our Mashiach saying, is he going to, to amongst the Greeks in the, dis the, sorry, is he going amongst the dispersed of the Greeks or the dispersed of his people that became the Greeks, right? Tubal is where we actually get the word for Vulcan. Right, Tubal Cain is the original worker of metals in the pre-flood antediluvian times, and that Tubal Cain is what was perverted into the false mighty one of Vulcan by the Romans later on. But uh, they were always in that area. Meshech and Tiraz again, the uh, the isle strips or the fingers of land that go down to the Mediterranean from Greece over to Spain was all what was given to them. Some of these people intermixed with the Hebrews, and that's something that we'll learn. The Hebrews spread out throughout that area. If you remember, there was the foretelling that Yepheth would dwell in the tents of Shem. And if you flip that around, that, that Shem was actually going into the tents of Yepheth, the literal, literal inhabited areas of Yepheth, and dwelling in places with them where they were invited or where they were not taking things by force. They were not, it was not held against them, but where they took areas by violence and where they held it by force, where they had already given, or it was established boundaries of their fathers, if you will, the children that did that are under the same curse as Cana on because that's what he did. And that would be liter the literal seed of Abraham. That's all throughout Europe today that all those Germanic and Celtic tribes that took those areas by violence, which is why um, they fell under the sway of Catholicism by violence, okay, because they reaped what they sowed. <clears throat> and we will continue to do so if until we repent and come out of here. That's what is the eventual goal of the coming of the truth and all these things where his people will realize that we have to leave the areas that we stole uh, by violence that were given to another. 
Some things weren't mentioned. The entirety of the world was not divvied up as we'll get into. But where I just mentioned these areas that were taken by violence and not invited to, they were invited to become the Greek people. They were invited. They found city-states. They, the, the, they did no evil to others. When there was disagreements and there was violence that happened, like the Trojans, they left. And then the ones that didn't amalgamated with the others that were getting what they deserve to the to the measure that they were perverting the truth that was given to them. All right. So, ob willing, and then you can see daughters born to all the sons so that these children had women to marry and to propagate their seed, right? And it says, then I, along with all my sons, began to cultivate the land. I planted a great vineyard on Mount Lubar. And in four years, it produced abundant wine for me. And I brought forth all of the wine. It breaks off. Now, you remember that's mentioned also in Genesis. And it, there's another account of this in what they call Yobelim or the Book of Jubilees. Okay. It says, when the feast came, this was the first of the fourth month, I believe, or the first of the first month, he was celebrating that feast with the new wine that he had in the fifth year, right? So, you know, oh, it tells you right here, I'm sorry. It says, on the first day of the first feast, so that would be the first day of the first month, right? Which is in the, it breaks off, first month, in my vineyard. And inside it of my vineyard, I opened this vessel and began to drink from it on the first day of the fifth year. After the planting of the vineyard, which is the instructions we get from Waikra or Leviticus, that after you plant a tree for the first three years, the seed is uncircumcised, not the fruit is uncircumcised, not to be eaten. And in the fourth year is Kadosh La Yahuwah, or set apart unto him. It's like the first fruits that are given to the Kohanim for their use. And in the fifth year, you can use it for yourself. Okay. So just as Adam in the garden and Hua in the garden and their creation and being brought into Eden and how all of that is rehearsed and re-walked out in every partaker of the truth, by following the instructions given to the children in the separations after the birth of a male or a female and etc those keeping those instructions with the trees and the remembrance of these appointed times are all walking out the truth and just as the patriarchs did just as our mashiach did and just as we will do for eternity being partakers of what is in reality the truth so i willing that should help everyone comprehend why it's important to actually keep the instructions on his appointed times because it's rehearsals for what we're going to be doing forever. It's what was, what is, and what is to come. It says, on that day, I called together my sons, my grandsons, and all of our wives and their daughters. We gathered together and went, breaks off, to the altar, I was barakin Yahuwah of Shamayim, Elion, or El Elion, right? El Most High, the great set-apart one who delivered us from the destruction. And then you can see it breaks off here, but this is him having his celebration or keeping the feast, and he had drank wine, and then he laid down to sleep where scripture mentions that he was drunk and this would have been when Sam rather <clears throat> sorry walked in on his nakedness and then um informed or shamed his father by informing his brothers of it and his brothers to their honor walked backwards and covered the shame of his nakedness to their benefit right so during that time where he was drunk and asleep, he had a vision. And this is what is being seen here. Okay. There's quite a bit of text. But you can see that all the birds of the Shamayim, the woods, the beasts of the field, the livestock and creeping things, they all take shelter under the, the tree that represents him. 
Okay. And then other trees and things come about for can talking forth of his descendants. And he's literally being shown a foretelling of future events and what would happen to his children throughout the ages. In the same way that Hanok got the animal apocalypse, Noach got this parable in in talking about different things in different ways, what the sun and moon represent, what the trees represent, what gold and silver is, what the beasts are. All right. Scripture talks about all of these things. And we've mentioned it before. So I'm just kind of I'm trying to flow along here for continuity's sake. He's shown all of creation all of history and what would happen to his children. And he's greatly astonished. He says, and he's amazed. He's even shown that um, Canaan would be cursed, which is why it says he knew what to do. He knew what had happened with Ham. Okay. So I'm not going to read all of this, but you feel free to pause it and look at them as you go. All right. This was a parable and it goes along with all the different parables. Uh, there's quite a few of them that cover the entirety of history. The uh, bright and dark waters of fourth or of second Baruch, the uh, three-headed eagle from fourth Ezra specifically for our times, and the rise of that fourth beast from the time of Julius Caesar through to Catholicism up until the return of our Mashiach. Right. Uh, you, you can see all of that. This one in particular, we don't have the definite details other than it is his literal posterity what would happen with his descendants all the way up to abraham at least and possibly the the coming of our mashiach okay and then after he received this vision he was given the explanation of it and then he awoke all right he was also showed the allotment and then it'll go into their divvying up the land and where it was set to. These things are also in Bereshit or Genesis and in Yobelim or what they call the Book of Jubilees, the, the partitioning of the land. The problems we have, not any one version agrees completely with the others for one reason or another, and we have to look at them see what is said and tie it together with actual history to to find out the truth of where the migrations of people are and then after you get past the monkey man moon science and the the violence done to secular records and historical accounts you can piece together how it lines up perfectly with archaeology real history and scripture okay so here is the portion where it's talking about the uh, dividing of the land and who got what inheritance. Again, I will leave you to pause and read these at your leisure. I recommend it. Compare it with the other accounts. But for our purposes, these are pretty broken. So we, we're just going to acknowledge them and, and cover here. What I really wanted to do is finish up where it gets to um, Noah's stuff right here today so that, ob willing, next week we can get right back into Bereshit and continue where we left off. <clears throat> Excuse me. See, he talks about the mountains of Ararat, and it passes west until it reaches Magog and everything along that is the gulf by the eastern sea the eastern sea um, might possibly be the mediterranean right or it could be talking about what we call the atlantic I, i'm sorry um i had that wrong the eastern sea would be the black sea when you're talking about where they're where they're portioning that out that's possibly the black sea and remember magog turkey East is the Black Sea. So whether that was completely accurate, again, this is in fragments. I, I encourage you guys to take the time to dig into this and look these things up because then you'll be more firm in your minds about what's being spoken. The actual geography, 
where the real literal children and descendants of Noah went to. All right. And here it's still continuing with that. Yah went to the islands of Sa alongside Lud, right? Which Lydia, Libya, right there on the north of the land. The islands that were there, what they call the um the Acapellos or the, the little islands right there on the western Mediterranean by Greece. Those were all given to them, right? All right, sorry about that. This stuff is really when you you don't always have the best information to deal with, and you're looking at this, you really have to piece it together. If you're not familiar with the Bible or just the common narration of Scripture, it would be best to just read that to get familiar with the the stories there, and then when you come back to something like this and you read it, it'll click and you know where it fits, and you don't have to. You'd be confused about things, right? Uh, and here we go. This is now Abram's section. So it segued right here. There's a transition. Where it's no longer speaking about Noah and his stuff. There's quite a bit of text missing. Lots, And then it goes right into Abraham's firsthand account of what he was doing with or in his life where he writes in the first person so we'll go ahead and s stop here and we will continue next week with our common or with the uh the bible the the normal accounts in the scriptures in genesis until we get to abraham's time and then we'll come back here and uh, have another witness for his firsthand transactions for some of the things that he went through i appreciate all of your time I'm sorry if any of this is confusing, but please feel free to ask questions or make comments if you feel so led. And we will see you all next week. You have a wonderful Shabbat and Shavuot uh, week ahead. Thank you.